Hi there, my name is David Dyer, and we're going to be talking here about some scripture verses. Specifically, we're going to talk about Galatians 2.20. I would like to read that verse here in a couple of versions, just to get us started. The New King James Version says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The New Living Translation, which is interesting, I don't usually like paraphrased translations, but I think it says it pretty well. The New Living Translation says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. <clears throat> okay, so here we have a very interesting verse. Paul is talking about something that was his experience. Now many people look at this as if Paul were teaching a new doctrine. Maybe he had a dream or a revelation and suddenly he woke up and thought, wow, I'm I'm dead. I've died to myself. I'm no longer living. And it could be that, oh well, it certainly is that Paul had revelation. But I believe that Paul was talking about his experience. He was talking about something that he himself knew to be real in his life. It wasn't just a doctrine for him, or a revelation, or a teaching. It was something he knew for himself. Now, let's think about that for ourselves. Let me ask you, is your self-life still living? Is it you that's alive? Or is it Christ? Who's living in you? Perhaps the best person to answer that question would be your wife, or your husband, or the people you work with, <clears throat> your family, those people who know you well. What would they say if you said, it's not me living here, it's just Christ. My actions reflect Christ, my words come from Christ, my reactions are divine, it's not me anymore, it's just Jesus. What would they say? What would the people you know well say? What would your husband or wife say? Would they say, ah, oh, well, maybe not. Perhaps that's your doctrine, but it's not really your experience. And so here we have a problem that's very common in Christianity. Many of the things which we profess to believe, and they are things that are true in an eternal sense, in a biblical sense, are not real in our lives. We believe them, we don't live them. They are not our experience. They're not what really our life is all about. And so let's think about this a little bit and let's talk <clears throat> what this means. I have been crucified with Christ. Well, in some way that we can't really understand or fathom, when Christ died on the cross, all humanity died with him. That's right, the race of Adam came to an end. Some people mistakenly call Jesus the second Adam, but the Bible calls Jesus the last Adam. He was the end of the race, and he was the beginning of a new race 
called the children of God. With him, the old ended and the new began. Well, that's wonderful. But is it real in your life? Is it your experience or is it only your doctrine, your belief, or even worse, your imagination? Something you're pretending is true, trying to imagine is true, trying to believe as a, all good Christians should believe in what the Bible says. But the fact is you are still alive, your self-life is still <clears throat> vigorous and flowering, and it isn't really Christ that's living in you most of the time. This is the reality for most Christians. They believe Galatians 2.20. They affirm it. I have been crucified with Christ. Well, yes and no. <laughs> in some eternal sense, yes. But in your experience, have you really been crucified with Christ? Let's start here with the subject of baptism. The Bible says that we are immersed or baptized into Jesus' death. Now we all know that baptism is not just a funny sort of bath with your clothes on. Baptism is symbolic of something. <clears throat> it's really symbolic of drowning, of a death. It's a kind of a death and resurrection. You're baptized in the water, <clears throat> and then you come up in resurrection. You're baptized into death, and you come up into resurrection. Now, perhaps, for many, this doesn't change their life very much either. Maybe they grasp the notion of a death and resurrection. Maybe they didn't. But it isn't seeming to make much impact in their life. <clears throat> I would like to suggest that maybe we should hold people under the water longer until they start really squirming and bubbles start coming up and they think, I'm going to die. Ah, okay, now, now you got it. Now you can come up. So, bab when we're baptized, <clears throat> we're declaring something to the universe. <clears throat> that is, I am ready and willing to die. I'm ready and willing to die. And why would I be willing to die? Now here, we're not talking about a physical death. But as we read in the <clears throat> paraphrase translation, my self-life has been crucified. It's not my bodily life, my physical life. It's an interior life. And why would that life need to die? What's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it is it sins. Automatically and spontaneously, I sin, and you sin, and everyone sins. Now, some people's sins are more obvious. Some people's sins are more hidden. <clears throat> but everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that we hate, we lust. We want something that someone else has. We want more. We're not content with what we have. We're jealous. We're angry. Sometimes people murder other people. They beat other people. There are all kinds of manifestations <clears throat> of the sinful nature of man. But if you really want to take have a look into sinful man, just take away law and order for a little while. And then you'll see what's really in there. So 
when no one is watching, <clears throat> when there's no repercussions, when there are no consequences for our evil, watch what people do, and then you'll see what sin is, and you'll see that man is really sinful. If you don't know about yourself that you're sinful, that simply means that you haven't gotten very close to God. Because God is supremely holy, completely holy. God is not trying to be holy. <clears throat> he is holy. And not just a little holy, but intensely and entirely holy. And that's what he wants for us to be. People who believe in Jesus, people who follow Jesus, are meant to become holy also. Well, this is good news and at the same time sort of bad news because I myself have tried to be holy and I can't seem to get there. I can't seem to do it. It seems like the natural evil that's in me breaks out without even my intending for it to. It just pops out at the least convenient times, in times of stress, in times of trouble, in times of temptation, uh, sometimes ugly things come out of it. But God has a solution for that. And this solution has two prongs. First of all, let's investigate the negative side of God's Negative, quote-unquote, because nothing God does is negative. And in fact, being free of sin at any price is not negative. It's great. We need it no matter what it costs. But there is an important fact that we must investigate. If you drive around almost any city or town... Sooner or later, you're going to come by an area of ground that is perhaps the holiest place in town. And what I mean by that is that no one who is there sins. These areas are full of people, but none of them sin. This place is called a graveyard or a cemetery. Nobody there sins anymore. And this corresponds with a scripture that says, He who has died has ceased from sin. That's where it is. The dead people no longer sin. And so this brings us back to our original verse, original idea about our co-death with Jesus Christ. This <clears throat> co-death needs to become real. It needs to be applied to us. <clears throat> it needs to become our experience. Oh, you mean I have to die? Well, yes, that's exactly it. We all need to die. This is a part of the gospel that very few people teach or preach. They avoid it. They want to get away from it. They either don't talk about it, or they try to pretend it's something that's already happened, something that exists in the mind of God, something you have to believe in, but you don't really experience. But the fact of the matter is, something in us needs to die. Death needs to be applied to us because only the dead do not sin. As long as your self-life is alive, it will sin. It might not sin every minute or every second of every day, but give it time, it'll sin. It'll get there. Just give it the right situation. In traffic, for example, that guy speeding along cuts you off and almost makes you have an accident. 
and you say, bless you, buddy, or something like that. Just give it time. It will come out. So there's something in us that needs to die if we are going to be freed from sin. The Bible says that we can be integrated into his death. Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, which comes through being integrated into his death. We're co-joined with him in his death. This is something that can become real to us. It be can become our experience. The death of Christ can be applied to us. Was Paul telling you his new doctrine that he dreamed up, a vision he had, an idea? Or was Paul saying, brothers and sisters, I've been with Christ for a long time. I've been walking with him and he's been working in me and this is where I've arrived it's no longer me no longer I I'm living here but it's Christ now this is our liberation from sin when it's no longer us doing the living I'm going to take another, a little detour here and talk about the other prong of God's solution because we're sort of caught here in a dilemma. If I die, <clears throat> if I were to die, where would that leave me? I'd be dead and that would, you know, pushing up daisies as they say. I'd be looking up and just seeing dirt and roots and little worms tickling me and that wouldn't be so good but God has also provided another part of this solution for us which is a new life when Jesus died on the cross he provided a new life for us and what life is that? it is the life of his father. That's right. The life of God was in Christ. It's interesting because in the English, English language, we only have one word for life. And this word is very broad in its meaning. If I were to ask you, how your how's your life? asking how's your health, how are your finances, how is your emotional state. The word life in English is big. But the Greeks had more than one word for life in the language in which most of the New Testament is written is Greek. They had at least three key words that we're going to talk about here for life. They had a word called bios from which we get our word biology. And it talks about our physical life, our, the way we make money, what we do during the day, our physical life, how we conduct it, our moral life, if we do things that are correct or evil, that's bios. There's also another word Isuke, which would be our psychological life. That is also our self-life or our soul life. And then there's a third word, zoe, which the Greek u Greeks used for certain circumstances. But the writers of the New Testament adopted this word. <clears throat> and most of the time, when it is used in the New Testament, it refers 
to the life of God. We read in John, in him was life, and Jesus was life, zoe. I am the way, the truth, and the life, zoe. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, he who eats me, even he will live by me. I am come that you might have zoe, life and have it more abundantly, John 10.10. 10. So you see this word in the New Testament that is used for God's life is zoe. It's also referred to as eternal life. Some Bible versions use the phrase everlasting life. But this is really very inadequate translation. Let me try to explain that. If I were to begin today and then last forever, that would be an everlasting life, a life that lasts forever. But God never began. He didn't, he was never born. <laughs> he always was. And his life is eternal life, or a life that spans the ages. It's not just everlasting, it's much more than that. It's a life without beginning and without end. That is what eternal life is. So Jesus is not offering us an everlasting life. That is a erroneous translation. He is offering us an eternal life. A life that never began. And a life it can never end. Not only it will never end, it can never end. Why? Because it is eternal. It's the life of God. Now when we believe in Jesus, when we open up our hearts to him, when we receive him, we are born of God. The Bible talks about those who are born not of the will of man, not of the will of the flesh, but of God. We're born of God. In John chapter 3, Jesus, talking to Nicodemus, talks about being born from above. Now, some Bible translations say born again in this passage. But Jesus used the phrase born from on high or born from above. It's not really being born again. I can't... No. Nicodemus was confused. I can't get back inside my mother and come back out and be born. Of course not. Something from on high can be born inside of us. We can't, we can't be born again. But something outside of ourselves can be born into us. And that is the life of of the Heavenly Father, the life of God, in the Greek is zoe. So when we're born of God, we're regenerated, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, incorruptible seed. Only God is incorruptible. And we're born of his seed. His seed germinates in us. His spirit joins with our spirit. Jesus explains that to Nicodemus. <clears throat> that which is born of the Holy Spirit is spirit, or our human spirit. That small s there refers to our human spirit. The Holy Spirit joins with our human spirit, sort of like uh, the sperm joins with an egg to create a living embryo. The Holy Spirit joins with our spirit and effects a new birth. We are born of God. And this life within us is eternal. Okay, now let's go back to our death. So now we see that there's hope. Even if I die, that won't be the end of me. Even if I allow 
crucifixion to happen in my life, I'll still be alive. Why? Because there's another life that will take the place of whatever I lose. So God's will, God's plan for his people, <clears throat> is for this old life to be crucified. This old life to be put to death through our experience of the death and resurrection of Christ. You know, it's really neat that Jesus died and rose again. But unless and until that becomes our experience, you and I will be bound by sin. Only the dead do not sin. And so if you want to be free from your sin, if you want to be free from who you are and what you are and your evil tendencies, there is only one solution, death. If by the Spirit you crucify the deeds of the flesh, you will live or you'll have life. I bet you can't guess what life that is. It's the Zoe life of God. So how does this happen? First, we have to understand something very important, and that is God will never do anything, nothing, inside of you that you don't want him to do. Nothing. He won't go one millimeter past where you feel comfortable or where you want him to be. What does that mean? If you don't want to die, the cross will not be applied to you. If you're not crying out for righteousness, if you're not willing <clears throat> to be dead to yourself, nothing's going to happen. And in many, many, many Christians, that's the case, nothing's happening, and it's easy to see Jesus taught us five times in the New Testament. If you love your life, <clears throat> you'll lose it. Or if you save your life, you'll lose it. What's this word life here? This soul life, which we have to lose, in the Greek is our suke life. Our interior self life. Jesus says, if you love your life, your suke life, you're going to lose it. But he who loses his life, suke life, the self life, for my sake, will find it. So, there's something that we have to lose. Jesus went on to say <clears throat> that we need to take up our cross and follow him. Well, that's interesting. Many years ago, when I was a younger believer, there was a man we met named Henry Pulsifer. And he had made a big wooden cross out of um, four by four posts, I think. And he had a little wheel on the back of it. And he had a pillow on his shoulder where he carried it. And he would walk around the nation holding this cross. So, but that isn't what Jesus was talking about exactly, that we need to get some wood and fabricate a cross and walk around the country. In Jesus' day, it was a fairly common sight to see someone carrying a piece of wood, a cross, or part of a cross. But he was never alone like Henry Pulsifer. He was always surrounded by a group of Roman soldiers. And he wasn't just wandering around the country roads like Henry. He had a destination. He was going to die. So when Jesus said, 
to be a disciple of his, we needed to take up our cross. He was talking about something, the death. A painful, prolonged torture. What? Jesus suffered for me already. Well, Jesus did suffer and die for us. But I want to tell you, as your friend and your brother, if you want to be free from sin and to be made like Jesus Christ, you are going to suffer. You're going to suffer a lot and painfully because who you are and what you are needs to be crucified also. Your crucifixion with Christ needs to become your experience, not just your doctrine, your imagination, your theory, or your idea. You need to be put to death and badly. We all do. Only in that way will be will we be free from sin. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you need to prepare yourself. Have this mind within you, which was also in Christ Jesus. For being in the form of God, I'm just paraphrasing here. He didn't hold on to being like God. He humbled himself. He became a man. This is the mindset you need to have. And being found in human form, he humbled himself even more and became obedient to death. Even the death of the cross. A painful, prolonged torture. Have this mind within you. Get ready. Prepare yourself. If you give God permission, <clears throat> he will apply the death of Jesus to you. But I'm warning you, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be fun. Let me tell you something else. It's the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to you. The universe can be rid of your self, your selfish, hating, lusting, coveting, angry self. And you can be rid of you too. This is great. You can be free from yourself. Do you have certain tendencies? Do you have certain desires? Do you have certain thought patterns you know are evil? You can be free. You can be free from that, everything. When Jesus died on the cross, he knew every human sin and condition, and his death was sufficient to deliver us from them all. When the angel appeared to Joseph, who married Mary, he said to Joseph, you will call his name Jesus and he will free his people from their sin. <clears throat> now I'm explaining to you how this freedom occurs. When you repent, what does that mean? That means that because of becoming close to God, light shines into you and you see some evil, some aspect of the evil that is you. And you say, oh, Lord, please save me. Forgive me and cleanse me. Forgive me and cleanse me. Save me from this. I don't want to be like that. I hate this. Whatever you have to do, Lord, do it. And he will arrange your life, circumstances, situations, 
so that you will be crucified. You will cease to exist in the area of your life. You will experience crucifixion for yourself. And along with that crucifixion, a liberation from sin. True, genuine, holy, eternal liberation. The interesting thing is that living people cannot resurrect. It's impossible. Only the dead can resurrect. Now, many Christians want to walk in newness of life. They want to walk in resurrection power. They want to walk in that risen experience. Well, amen. But there's a prerequisite. You have to die. If you're going to walk in the resurrection life, first you have to walk to Golgotha. You have to walk to the cross. Now, this isn't something you can do to yourself. People can't crucify themselves. You know, they may be able to pound in their feet. It's going to hurt, but they could probably do it. And you could probably start a nail here and pound one nail in, but that other hand is hard to pound. You can't crucify yourself. But the Holy Spirit can apply the death of Christ to you. It can happen. It's something real. It's an experience that all Christians can have. They can know it. They can pass through it. You know, when Jesus started about talking about the cross and being crucified, most of his followers disappeared. They left. And there were 12 still there. <clears throat> Jesus turned to them and said, are you leaving too? He said, no, you're the one who has the words of eternal life, of God's eternal life. So when you start talking about the cross, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. When you start talking about the preaching of the cross, most people who call themselves Christians are going to get up and leave. They don't want, they didn't sign up for anything like that. They wanted blessings. They wanted healing. They wanted peace. They wanted solutions to their problems. <clears throat> they didn't want to die. You can be a believer in Christ without dying, I think. But you can't be his disciple. If you're going to be a disciple, you have to carry that cross, pick up that cross, whatever that might mean to you, in your circumstances, in your marriage, in your job, in your life. You are going to suffer and pass through intense suffering. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's the Bible words. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's the way to be free. You know, the good thing is that when something dies, then there is a resurrection. When we die, then comes resurrection. This new life, this divine life, this holy life grows. It replaces what we lost. It replaces what we lost, which was no loss at all. It's a relief. It's a salvation. It's a liberation. I'm going to tell you a little secret here. <clears throat> Jesus says, he who saves his soul life will lose it. If you don't want that crucifixion, if you don't want that pain and suffering, if you don't want all that stuff, you want to hang on to that life you got, 
It's worked pretty good until now, and we're going to keep it. Jesus says, you will lose it. It's going to be destroyed. Why is that? Why are you going to lose it? Well, because it sins. Naturally and spontaneously, our self-life sins. And so, it can't continue to occupy space in the universe. Let's imagine that God makes a new heaven and a new earth, which he's going to make someday. And there you or I are, still with our self-life. We're behaving pretty well. We're going along good until all of a sudden, one day, we sin. And the whole new creation of God is destroyed. When God created the world in which Adam and Eve lived, he said it was good. Did a good job. But one fine day, <clears throat> Adam and Eve sinned. Now how many sins were necessary to destroy that creation? Just one. One sin. One little sin destroyed the creation. From that one sin came death, robbery, hate, murder, mosquitoes, all that stuff you hate came from that one sin. And so when God makes his new creation, no sinners are going to get in. None. Something is going to happen to these people before they can get into that new creation. And it's called a destruction of their soul life. It's going to be destroyed. I'll give you a hint. It's going to be destroyed by fire going to be burned up. But at that stage of the game, there is no more resurrection. There's no death and resurrection available after the grave. There's only loss. If you hang on to your soul life, if you love it, you're going to lose it. It's gone already. You just don't know it. It's under judgment because it's sinful and you cannot change the nature of your own life. No amount of Bible study, training, education, self-restraint, psychological manipulation can change what you are and who you are. You can't change it. A life is what it is. You can't make a dog into a cat. You can't make an apple tree into a banana tree. They are what they are. I know some people are trying to make something into something else. But the fact of the matter is, you are what you are. And what are we? We're sinful. And God has a solution, several solutions, in fact, for our sin. Today, our solution is to be baptized into his death, to be immersed again and again. Paul said, I die daily. He was experiencing a daily death to self. He was suffering. He was being beaten. He was being stoned. He had a lot of suffering in his life. But it led him somewhere. It led him to a day in which he said, Look, guys, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. How do we know that? How do we know that about ourselves? How do we know that about others? Evidence. Real living. 
living together with other people, seeing what comes out of us in times of stress, difficulties, and temptations. That's how we know what's in there. And how we know to cry out to God for more of the operation of his cross. I think it was Hudson Taylor who said this. I could be wrong about who said it. But he said, he is no fool who loses what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So what we have, we can't keep. It's defective. It's permanently defective. But what we get in its place, the replacement part, <clears throat> is eternal. It's not just everlasting. It's eternal. And this new life has its own nature. This new life has a nature that is holy, it is loving, it's truthful, it's kind, it's good, it's forbearing. It's forgiving. This new life has the nature of God himself. The nature that Jesus exhibited to the world while he walked physically on this earth. And this divine nature is what Christians are supposed to be exhibiting, showing to those around them. The word Christian means a little Christ. You know, the salvation which Jesus offers is free. You can't buy it. But yet we hear Jesus saying, before you start out to follow me, sit down and count the cost. How much is this going to cost? Do I have the willingness for this cost? Even though it's free, it's going to cost you everything you are, everything you hope for, your plans, your future, your self-life. There's a cost. But if you really saw what you're losing, it's trash. There are a lot of translations for that word. I think the King James uses the word dung. It's junk. If you really saw what it was in the eyes of God, you'd, you'd run away from it. You wouldn't want it. But it's strange how much we <clears throat> hold on to our old self-life. What we are. When we could exchange it for the life of God, which is by nature holy and pure and attractive. So I'm going to sign off here just for now, and uh, maybe we'll get back to some of this later. But thank you for listening, and may God bless you, and may he lead you more and more into intimacy with himself, which changes you fundamentally from what you are into what